choice. The sixth album by Steel Panther on the Prowl that was released on February 24th. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Now we're good on that. And uh, currently on tour. Where are you in Philadelphia right now? Yeah, man. I just got uh, back. We went for, uh, Sasha and I went for a long coffee journey, man. We, get, we land in the town. We wake up pretty much the same time and uh, get the Starbucks app out and find the nearest Starbucks. And that's like, that's our first, you know, like hiking thing that we do together. And then they, <laughs> they went to the gym, you know, to work off their hangovers. And here I am. Cool, cool. All right. So Philadelphia, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Detroit. I think it's Massachusetts or Minnesota. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, you're Rochester. Right. Yes. M.A. Um, Perrin? Yeah. Well, why don't we start there? Why don't we, before we have some fun, let's talk about the record. So at the very least, the record has the album cover of the year. And who knows? It might be the album of the year, too. So what's what's up with On the Prowl? What's different? I'm assuming On the Prowl is not a tribute to the loudness record of 1991 On the Prowl. These are your, your own uh, compositions. So tell us about On the Prowl and, and what's different, what's new. Well, it's really nice to know somebody else other than Steel Panther knows who loudness is. Because you know that's that's a that's a really deep like a deep cut on a record, right? Yeah. But for the guys like us that you know grew up during that time, they were you know they were they were pretty popular back then. Yeah, and so, we'd yeah. love it if you, if you bust out a Crazy Nights cover, you know, and whatever MZA yeah. is, we'd love to hear yeah. it. You know, it's pretty cool. I, I love that band. Uh, so yeah, this record on the Prowl is pretty cool. I really love the album cover too. We had uh, we did a tour with a band called Airborne. Uh, they joined us for our Australian tour, and uh, the artist that made the artwork for the actual tour poster for that tour in Australia, we really loved it. So we we contracted this artist to uh, to make our own cover, and that's what she came up with. And she did a kick ass job. It's so cool. It's fun to look at. Like yeah, it, it's an eye catcher. I, yeah, when I look at the cover, I'm like, I want to hear what's on that record. You know, that's fun. Well, we come from a generation where we all went to record stores, right? And sometimes if you only had 10 bucks in your pocket and you were kind of looking through the bins, sometimes it's it's the record with that cool cover is the one that you wound up taking home with you. So a yeah. uh, little, little nod to the old school there of the cover. And then so oh, yeah. what, about, what about the music? What about, so like, I mean, it's it's obviously the Steel Panther we've all come to uh, know and love, but any anything different, anything to kind of spice it up for you guys? Yeah, I, I can tell you all about that. I just want to back up to the, the, the record artwork first really quick. Sure. So, like, if you buy the vinyl, right, it's the, exactly what you always loved when you were a kid. Like, looking at, you know, you open up the middle of our new record on the Prowl, and there's a huge picture of us on this couch, like, looking full metal. And, you know, and there's all the lyrics that are in there for you to read along with, all the thank yous are in there to read. And there's, it's, a fun, it's a fun read. So you can actually put the record on, and spend time, you know, reading along with it. It's it's really cool. And the uh, record was made during the pandemic, which was uh, I don't know. We didn't realize we'd be doing a record during the pandemic because we were already when the pandemic hit. We were supporting our latest record, which was called Heavy Metal Rules. Yep. And uh, so the pandemic hit, and everybody's doing the same thing like everybody else in the band. We're all feeling the same way everybody in the whole world was feeling like where how are we going to pay our bills what's going to happen all the scary stuff and then once it kind of mellowed out we figured out we can live on food stamps we just you know figured out what to do and and uh, but the thing about this record is we did it all ourselves for the most part except for the mixing process and the reason we did it all ourselves is because we spent all our capital that we had saved up you know, maintaining our life, my life. Life's crazy. Home. Yeah. So yeah. we didn't have money to go in the studio and do it traditionally. So uh, we were, I don't, I don't want to say we're forced, but we were like, fuck, we're, let's do it. Cause Satchel had like seven months during the pandemic to write these great songs. And he wrote them. He's just an amazing writer, in my opinion. You know, he's, he's really extremely talented. And uh, when he started sending over songs during the pandemic, I'm like, holy shit. He's obviously got a lot more time on his hands to really like focus on what's going on in his life. 
And a lot of the lyrics are reflective of where we're at collectively as a band. So it's it's kind of, I think there's a little more touchy feely on this record than the most of the Steel Patent records. Well, the first one was really you know, that, that for us, but the, this one really is kind of similar in that case, the process, you know, it was all, all, it was us or all or nothing, you know? And we weren't touring, we weren't tired from touring, we weren't like trying to fit it into our schedule. Because usually when you're out touring, you have to tour to pay the bills, keep the lights on, but then you also have to centralize to write music and then we have to record it. And we were doing it on the road, off the road, on the road, off the road. And it just kind of, uh, it makes it more difficult. So this way it was, it was definitely more comfortable. And we were able to, we recorded all the vocals at Sticks' studio and Satchel would come in on FaceTime and Sticks and Satchel produced my vocals. So in other words, what that means for people who don't know, like I'll be singing a take and we'll all sit there and we'll analyze it. Like, okay, is that good? Which take is the best one? And then we would comp different takes together and uh, put together a whole song. And it's usually our producer, Jay Rustin would do that. Um, but like I said, we we're, you know, dealing with a financial yeah. shortfall. So, you know, we just did it ourselves. And it, it was a really scary, but fun process. And at the end, after Jay mixed it all with his fucking magic, this guy is like, he's, he's a very talented producer and mixer. And uh, he mixed the shit out of this record. It sounds really powerful, clear. You can hear everything. I agree. He, make, he makes every song sound like a like it should be on the radio, in my opinion. Jimmy K here, Metal Voice. Look at this. The Metal Voice shirts are now on sale. Just go to the video description to find out on how you can purchase one. Metal! All right. The, uh, the single, 1987, is the last single that was released. Oh, by the way, note, out of the 21 Loudness albums, I have about 10 or 15 of them. So I, I collect, I love Loudness. Loudness. Awesome. Yeah. 1987, you know, so we're all pretty much the same age. And and I think this is a song that sort of might be actually, you know, big. it'll be a breakthrough song in the sense that it kind of, it borders comedy, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's retro in a sense that People remember 1987. Yeah, well, we got it. You know, we got all the references. I know that. <laughs> Can you elaborate on what 1987 means to you? Yeah, it, it's a love song. It's a love song about a time that was decadent, fun as hell, and will never be repeated again. You know, and that's like you know you don't really realize what you're in until it's gone. You know, it's like when you got a you know a girl and you guys start fighting like fuck you and you're finished and then you you're out there looking for another chick and you're like god man she was great I miss her so much but it's gone you know it's kind of the same thing it's like uh, 87 was the peak of heavy metal and then shortly after five years shortly five years later it was if you had long hair it's like you're unvaccinated you know what I mean it was like <laughs> Get out of here. We fucking hate you now, you know? You can't eat here. Yeah. You're making us all sick. But, uh, yeah, that, that's what that song means to us, you know? And it, it really, man, there's so many lines in there that even hit me while I'm singing it. Like, last night we played in New York at Irving Plaza, and we're doing 1987. There's a dude about our age. He's filming, and he's fucking crying, dude. Like, crying. Crying at a Steel Panther show. That's not really synonymous with Steel Panther crying. And, and that's what I was getting at. You're you are kind of like, it's comedy, but you're also bordering on, you know, a, a decade. Yeah. Uh, well, not even a decade, but a, a period, a golden era. And, and, and people get all sensitive. So yeah. you're kind of going away from the comedy a bit. And now you're getting into sort of a, uh, what's the right word? Well, it's... Right. It's a history lesson, right? It's also a history lesson for people younger than us. Yeah. Well, but it's the, different, but it, we connect, but we connect more with, you know, the White Snakes and the Guns and Roses and when they started going off, right? Yeah. I think that this song is really definitely reflective of the times when it was written. Yeah. So Satchel wrote it during the pandemic. And, I, and I'm sure you guys may feel the same way, but I, I know for, I, for me, I felt the same way as Satchel's. It felt like, you know, we're home. We can't do what we love to do. We're stuck. 
We're worrying about, you know, taking care of our families, all the stuff that goes with it. And you start really reflecting on what your life is all about. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how that, that kind of came up from that, from that, it stems from that, in my opinion. And so, you know, you're reminiscing and thinking, oh God, remember those times, looking at old pictures and, you know, cause you have way more time on your hands, man. I've never sat around and did so much shit on my computer ever. My, I think I got shingles from sitting too long. You know what I mean? But it was, uh, I think that's what it is, you know, and people can, I think people can relate to that on a, a more human level. You know, Steel Panther is usually, uh, it's really about being in the moment for Steel Panther. So when you go to Steel Panther show, you get a laugh. You get to talk about shit with your buddies. You're like, oh my God, you already just said, holy fuck, this is crazy. I can't believe they're saying this shit. How come they're not canceled? You know, all that kind of thing. And you just kind of, you're able to escape reality for a while, you know? And then when we start singing 1987, it kind of brings you back into reality, but you're still not in reality. You're going backwards, you know what I mean? So it's it's really, I suggest microdosing before our show, man, because I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a trip, man. It's, it's really, you know, music resonates with people in so many different ways. And I think that this particular song resonates with people pretty much in the exact same way, even for kids, because I don't know if you've noticed this, but I have a lot of kids are, and when I say kids, I mean, 15, 14, 16, that age, right? That was really weird counting, but you know, you, you think about that age and they're like, God, I wish I was born in the eighties. It's true. Wow. Really cool. I love metal. It's my favorite music. How are these kids hearing metal? They're not going to the record stores and looking for it. They're on Spotify or YouTube looking. Up. You know, you know when we were when we were living it, we never thought it would end. You know, like, oh, but it not. did end. It end like this. this yeah, this you, that's what I, that's what I was saying. It's like you know, you, you don't realize what you have until it's gone. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, people really look back at it fondly. Even people that did live through that era, and I think everyone can relate on on uh, on that particular song that way. It's cool, man. It's a really good song. And it makes you, if you don't have a little bit of compassion and some overwhelming feelings of reminiscing and love and connection, hearing that song, then you probably might want to start doing drugs. But <laughs> that song is a song where you go, oh my God, man, Steel Panther, really, they fucking, this, they're done, dude. But then you can also listen to Friends with Benefits, you know, and go, oh, no, wait, no. They're, they're back. They're back. They're back. <laughs> so, so speaking of, of, of being on drugs, uh, you guys are out on tour right now. Uh, so. Yeah, one second. Oh, <sighs> 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 okay. Yeah. yeah, eyes all wide open. Uh, so tell us about the tour. I think you guys are out with Crowbot and uh, Tragedy. I saw Tragedy not too long ago. They were like a really good time. And then we saw that you're doing some UK dates with Winger. And we, we thought that was kind of cool that, you know, a band that you kind of probably make reference to in a lot of ways in a lot of your lyrics is all of a sudden going to be out with you uh, in the UK. So tell us yeah. a little bit about what's happening with the US tour, what's happening next maybe in the UK, what, what's going on on tour? Well, we got about almost a month left on this uh, beginning of the US run. And we're out with a band that's direct support called Crowbot. And they're a really great band. I, I know you guys know who they are. And they're just solid, awesome dudes, great tour buddies and shit it's you know touring is like being with a family you know you're together like a family we eat together we hang out together sound check together all that stuff and it's got to work you know the, that chemistry's got to work otherwise it's no fun and we really enjoy having a fucking good time and those guys fit right in and then tragedy man what a great surprise that's been you know people really dig them they're fun you know they they do metal covers of of disco shit and it's yeah. fucking awesome man you know it's cool to go you know when you go to a show and you get to watch all the bands before the band you went to go see and they're fun bands and they're fun to watch that makes for a great night you know and it's worth the ticket price when you get three bands that that make that move you and the same thing is going to happen in the uk we're going to go on tour with winger dude can you believe that yeah. like, how does that and how does that how do you go from crowbot and tragedy to like winger because i mean it, we're kind of all related but it's kind of a different era also yeah but it is a different era it, you know it's one of those things you guys 
excuse me, sorry to cut you off. It's one of those things where everything just kind of aligned properly. Now we've talked about touring. We had this whole tour campaign that we're going to do with Limp Biscuit, and we did all the photo shoots for it. We we're going to go out together and call it like the Circus Rock Show or some shit. And because we were trying to, to match polar opposites and, you know, have some video vignettes of us fucking fighting and shit. But anyways, it, it didn't align. It didn't work out. They got some bitching festivals they couldn't get out of. We got some work we couldn't get out of. And it never came to fruition. And we've been talking about going on tour with, together, Winger and us, and it just hasn't lined up until now. It just happened to line up. It worked out. And we're going to go do it. And I, I'm so excited to, to do that with Winger because, you know, they're one of the bands that got killed by heavy metal. And we're one of the bands that are trying to bring heavy metal back. And we love Winger. So this is, you know, this is our fuck you to, to the, the era that killed metal, man. Fuck you. So maybe we get a uh, Kip Winger, Michael Starr, 17 uh, duet by the end of the tour. Yeah, that'd be cool. They, we can, I'll do it. You know, she's only 17 and he can sing 17 girls in a row with us. Awesome. <laughs> there you go. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Yes, that. yes. It's, it's a theme. It's a theme. It's I like that. 17 <laughs> so, okay, let's talk about in the 80s when uh, when bands talked about Satan and black metal, there were people burning records and they were trying to get canceled. What you just spoke about before, Steel Panther. Do you have like I don't know snowflakes outside your shows, uh, trying to cancel you guys? Has there been any pushback? Um, are they burning I don't know USB sticks now with your albums on it or deleting files? I don't know what they're doing, but or maybe they're taking LPs and they're just throwing them in a bonfire. What's going on? Are you getting pushback from your shows and from your music today? No, not really. Shocking as I mean, I don't want to say not really. I will just say, I mean, the only pushback we got was for a plugin that Satchel designed called the Pussy Melter. <laughs> and it was on TC Electronics website. And a girl guitar player saw it and she got extremely offended by it. And she wrote the company. And then they pulled out, they took the plugin off because one person was upset with it. And so Satchel came over with the idea. He said, why don't we just make a fucking guitar pedal? We're like, okay, so we got into the guitar pedal business. Man, that thing flew off the shelf so quick because people were trying to cancel us. Everybody, we uh, we only made like, I think 10,000 of them or something, just a, just a small order of them because it's expensive to get that capital to make them all, right? So we made like 10,000 and we made a limited edition uh, and a cutoff at a certain number. And uh, we sold them all in like two weeks. And, uh, so, and so that somebody tried to cancel us, you know, like a sub category of us and it kind of backfired on them. Um, because, you know, you look at all the other pedals, there's like a pedal called the Big Muff. Oh my God, I'm so offended. I'm so offended. You know, come on, dude, fuck. The Ball Buster, there's so many like, anyways, my point is, People that come to our shows, they know what to expect. No one walks off the street and goes, oh, that looks like a fun show. I'm going to go in, buy a ticket, and go and go, oh, my God, I am so offended by them saying fuck or whatever. You know, they, they said Asian hooker. That's so racist. You know, people that come know what they're coming into. You know, they know they're coming to a show where they're going to laugh and hear some profane, politically incorrect humor. And, and if it's their first time, it's because their friend brought them, you know, and people are pretty aware of what's going on. So I think everyone's, everyone is there for the same party. So I, we really, really haven't experienced any of that. Camp, camp, it's camp. good to hear. It's good to hear. Humor's got, you know, humor is the last stand, right? In freedom yeah. of speech. All we got left. <laughs> yeah, I think that people, our shows have been selling out on this tour. And I like to attribute it to how great my hair looks, but it's not that, you know, it's more like, you know, uh, people are sick of not being heard. You know, people are sick of not being heard and people are sick of fucking getting bullshitted and they want something that they can count on. You know, you go to a sports game and for the most part, you can count on it being an even match refereed, maybe, you know, rest may fuck up a couple calls. At the end of the day, at the end, somebody wins and somebody loses. There's truth to that, right? 
And when you come see us, at the end of the day, you're going to get drunk, you're going to laugh, you're going to have a good time. You can't argue with that. And I think people really want to just do that. So we want to talk about, you know, we want to get your thoughts. There's a lot of metal stuff in the news right now. So we figured who better to ask than Michael Starr on, you know, some of the metal current events. So like one of the biggest things in the news this week is Motley Crue. So obviously Mick Mars is out, John Five is in. All of a sudden making the rounds this week, Carmine Apice, who's friends with Mick Mars, has said that, you know, Mick really wasn't happy in the crew anyway. They're using all kinds of tapes and just, just all kinds of drama in the Motley Crue camp. So just thoughts on John Five replacing Mick Mars, thoughts on Carmine Apice out of nowhere kind of saying Motley Crue are using tapes. Just riff on that. Well, as far as tracks are concerned, you know, people get all freaked out because fans use tracks, right? In my opinion, it doesn't really matter. You know, we could hire a keyboard player and a guy to do the shaker and another rhythm guitar player, but we can't afford it. So it's like we can put these things on tracks and use them and it, it sounds killer. And it's, you know, the most important thing for us to do is to, when people come to our show and they hear us play our music, it sounds as close to the record as we can get, you know, with that live feel. Because that's what I really loved. I used to go see the Scorpions play live. I was like, holy shit, they sound like the record. But, you know, as far as the, the um, I don't even want to say dysfunction, but whatever's going on with Mick, you know, I don't know him personally. And I don't, I don't really know many people in that camp. But uh, hopefully, you know, John Five is a great fit. He's kicking ass. He's been a great guitar player for fucking, what, 30 years. He's an amazing dude, super nice guy. And uh, they sound great. So hopefully uh, they get it all worked out. And maybe Carmine should just start a band with Mick Mars. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's no need to go out and lobby for other people. You know, Mick is old enough to take care of his own shit. Yeah. Just start a band with him. <laughs> That's a good idea. All right. So uh, what else we got here? Um, a little word association since you're the doctor of 80s. Are you good with that? Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll give you a name, and you can kind of give us the first thing that comes to your mind. Sounds good. All right. Well, I'll do Vince Neil. Ooh. Fuck. <laughs> I can't do it, dude. Give him another one. Give him another one. No, hey, say Nicky Six. So ready? Nicky Six. Uh, wait, take two. Go ahead. Vince Neil. Motley Crue. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Vince Neil is oh, Nikki Six. Pain in the ass. Gene Simmons. Bitchin' dude. Tommy Thayer. Awesome. Another awesome guy. All right. David Lee Roth. The King. Well, in that case, Sammy Hagar. Second King. Oof. Gary Jerome. <laughs> Gary Jerome. Extreme. Best guy. Okay. Van Halen. Nope. And he knew it too, but he wanted to do it so bad. He's like, let's do it. I think what they did was killer, but man, have you heard the new extreme song? Yeah. It's we better have, than Man Halen. We so, have. And actually, it? side note, V8, today is the anniversary of VH3. VH3 came out whatever number of years ago today. So everyone's debating the merit of VH3 today. So yeah, but, I, but like I, you said, it's better than Van Halen. Yes. You know, I, I let me rephrase that. Okay. The song is catchier than the songs that Gary did with Van Halen, in my opinion. Gotcha. We wouldn't want to misquote you and wind up big headline on yeah. like, <laughs> everywhere saying, you know, Star uh, thinks Van Halen sucks. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, how about back to word association, Wolf Van Halen? Oh, amazing. It's been so nice that during the pandemic, listening to him after his father passed, just, it just, man, that was like for me, like 1987. Like I, I listened to it, the songs, and it just brings me back to, Van Halen, and then to see their relationship together, because you know he released all those videos of his dad. Yeah, very touching, very touching. Oh my God, it made me cry, and I just felt so connected to his music, and it's really good, and his dad loved it, and it's just a fucking awesome thing. And I know that his associate with his dad has been very difficult for him to deal with, so, but man, I, I, I love the guy, I think he's great. Kurt Cobain. A wasted life. I wish he didn't take his own life. You know, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Could you imagine what he'd be doing right now? 
you know, after it's all said and done, you guys, grunge killed heavy metal. But once I got over it, you know, for the most part, I was able to look back at, at some of the music and go, man, there's some fucking amazing bands, man. Alice and Chains, STV, fucking Soundgarden. Yep. Yeah. But, and you just named three bands where the singer has gone also. So, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, dude, it's a bummer because who knows? Look look what Chris Cornell did with Audio Slate. It was fucking awesome. You know, and they did some rock shit, which is really cool. You know, and who knows what Kurt would have done. So, yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely a wasted wasted life, in my opinion. Okay. This is an interesting one for me. Tracy Guns. Good friend. All right. That's good. He know. fucking taught me so much about touring. That was my first ever real tour was with LA Guns. Yeah. You know, we did, I did two years with them and I learned the ins and outs of what it's like to be a replacement singer, what it's like to be on the road, what it's like to only live off of 50 bucks a week, you know, all that shit. We had a, we had such a great time, man. All right. The last few questions. When are you planning your first farewell tour? I don't know, bro. That's going to be a tough one. It's like, when's the, the, the best time to have your never-ending farewell tour. When do you yeah, plan on doing You got to start somewhere. Yeah, you got to have the, the farewell tour, the bio, book, the biography, and you got to have the documentary, and then start selling more shit online. I don't know, bro. I, I, I'm I really, we really are still enjoying what we're doing, and I really, I just want to keep doing it until we can't do it anymore. Okay. Well, if, I mean, really, case, if there's no farewell tour, then... You know, Def Leppard announced it this week, so you have to have this on the horizon. Is there is there a Steel Panther Symphony record uh, on the horizon? I heard that last night in my bunk. I was going through Instagram. I was like, that's interesting. I really want to hear it. You guys got to do it. Until you've heard 1987 or Tiger Woods with, with a symphony, I don't know. So, like, is, is is there a symphony that would like to work with you? I don't know. Probably not. Would it work? Would it, Yeah, it would totally work. Dude, Satchel, he is the... He is... The, he is extremely talented he could probably write all the shit for the orchestra to fucking play this guy's satchel is the most underrated heavy metal guitar player in the history of heavy metal all right you think about it who's better than him right now he Just kicks ass guitar. man he freaking kicks ass that's all i'm gonna say name one guitar player that's yeah. better than him right now mm, richie oh, faulkner richie ooh. faulkner Richie Faulkner from Judas Priest. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> I like Chewy from Voivod, but, you know, it's a different genre altogether. So in that genre, I agree with you. Well, you know, the whole thing about Guitar Heroes is it is subjective. So obviously, I'm, I'm a singer. So I think he's the best guitar player in the world. But when I watch him play, I'm a guitar player too. And I play pretty well. But when I watch him, it makes me never want to pick up a guitar again. You know what I mean? He, he does. He kills it. I, I'm going to agree with you, man. He, he kills it. He, he's just amazing. You know You know why? He has taste, tasteful, colorful solos. Yeah. Very, very 80s reminiscent, too. That, we're, yeah, that he, we don't have today. That we don't have oh, today. You don't have it today. And also, it's also the attack he has with this, with this pick. It's just, uh, it's an angry, fucking mean tone. And, you know... Uh, Fuck, I don't know. I was going to say something. I forgot. That's Man, the frontal lobe is going quick, guys. Sorry. It's all right. We've got one minute. Perrin, last question. Well, what do we, where do we want to end it? Well, you're talking about Satchel. Well, Nita Strauss kind of left Alice Cooper to go do this thing with Demi Lovato. And now yeah. Alice welcomed her back. So is Satchel out to cheat on you? Like, do you guys have an open relationship? Like, is he, can he moonlight? Like, what's up? We all, we all moonlight. Because we have, we, don't, we have so many friends. I just uh, did a song for uh, a guitar player called So. Her name is Sophie Lloyd, and uh, she's playing with uh, Machine Gun Kelly right now. And her and I collaborated on a tune. It's uh, just getting mixed, and we're going to put it out in a few months. But uh, yeah, we we do all kinds of stuff. All kinds yeah. of stuff. Yeah, all right. Satchel has his own guitar line. He does. It's so Satchel can cheat. Satchel can cheat on. On that on note, the seventh right. album on the Prowl, not Loudness on the Prowl, but Steel Panther on the Prowl. Pick it up. They're going through North America, and then it's UK, correct? After North America. Yep. And then Brazil. Then Brazil. All right. And then, you know our our uh, United our North American run is going to will extend through J July through uh, September. Thank you very much. 
cool. Michael Starr for being on the show. Thank you so much. We wish you all the success. And uh, I'll go out there. Have a good time. Go see a Steel Panther. Yeah, why not? What do you got to lose?